Okay, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Charles Moyer, one of the registrars at the University of Cape Town. Um, uh, welcome once more to our Wednesday UCT African um, meetings. Uh, today, I thought I would uh, discuss this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, case, these cases of uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. And um, I will try and discuss uh, where you know surgical intervention can be a, a consideration. Uh, these are quite rare tumors, and uh, I mean, we are usually hardly involved in, in in management of these tumors. But this is actually a quite a common um, exam exam question, despite the fact that uh, they are they are quite rare. So I have no disclosures. Um, and um, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is basically um, is a soft tissue sarcoma uh, that is pathologically ca characterized by abnormal myogenesis. It is um, actually the most common soft tissue tumor, uh, soft tissue sarcoma in in children and adolescents, uh, despite the fact that they are they are rare. Uh, they can, however, be rapidly proliferate. Um, and it may actually double in size um, in a space of about two weeks. And um, they can uh, metastasize to distant sites like lung, bone, liver, and uh, hematogenous uh, spread is much more uh, common uh, than, than uh, um, a lymph node, uh, a hemat hematolymphoid spread. So um, as I have alluded previously, these tumors, they are quite rare, accounting for about 3 to 4% of all childhood uh, malignant tumors. And the kind of typical age of onset is uh, between two to five years. That is in about 50% of cases. According to the US uh, statistics, there is about 350 uh, new cases per year uh, with an incidence of about five cases uh, per, per million. And uh, due to you know improved um, management uh, strategies, uh, we find that um, in patients with localized disease, there's actually um, good about more than eighty percent uh, survival rates. Um, if you look at the, the epidemiology, there's a slight uh, a, you know small uh, male predominance, um, with the Asians less susceptible than. Um, the whites of the plague races. Um, it's been noted that in some people, literature that it has higher incidence is in mothers with a history of breast tumor. And um, there is actually a role of genetics as it's been shown to be uh, associated with these um, um, uh, syndromes that I have uh, listed uh, below. Um, and also environmental exposure also has been um, alluded to as uh, one of the risk factors, for example, cocaine exposure, marijuana, or uh, pre kind of uh, natal um, ra um, radiation, um, radiation exposure. There are other you know, non-proven risk factors like low birth weight or high BMI, uh, you know, exposure to antibiotics, but all these things have been, haven't been proven in literature. And then if you look at the histology classification, um, it, you know, conventionally, uh, Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma has been classified into, into kind of three uh, different uh, classification based on histology. Um, the, by far the most common uh, form is the embryonal uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, uh, which we also, you know, is, uh, has got three subclasses. Uh, you can get what you call the, the, the classic um, uh, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma, that is the most common uh, entity with an intermediate prognosis, which is characterized by these sheets or clusters of, of densely packed um, um, myoplasts with uh, kind of mild to moderately hyper, you know, uh, chromatic uh, uh, you know, staining nuclei. Um, and then you also can get the portrait type that is deposited in this uh, image below. Uh, which is uh, less common, common, but has got quite a favorable prognosis. Um, this is uh, it's characterized by kind of a more dense architecture and a sub, a sub mucosal um, um, 
um, involvement. This, as you can see, this was a, a biopsy from the um, from the nasal mucosa, which shows uh, respiratory epithelium, and then shows this submucosa layer uh, uh, of, of of dense um, uh, a, a myoplast. And then you also can have the sclerosing and the spindle cell, um, a, 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 you know, subclass of of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma that carries uh, um, a, a, that that bears a very poor a poor prognosis, and this one is characterized by um, the myosin D1 um, uh, mutation. And then the other um, class is uh, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, which is um, which accounts for about you know twenty percent of, of cases, and uh, it's, this uh, entity is found mostly in adolescents. Um, and in about 70% of cases, there's no evidence of uh, uh, striated uh, mass differentiation. And uh, particularly the alveolar type of rhabdomyosarcoma is characterized by these pseudo-alveolar um, spaces and these uh, fibrovascular um, 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 uh, differentiation um, uh, on, on, on the histology. So you'll find that you need at least, um, you know, more than 50% of your architecture should be um, kind of alveolar type for one to actually classify uh, the tumor as, as being alveolar type. And then um, the uh, lesser common uh, entity is the pleomorphic or the adult type. Uh, that's typically seen in adults and uh, typically presents in the extremities and uh, you know it has got a poor prognosis, and patients often present present um, with advanced disease and and metastasis. And there is also one uh, you know other entity that's been described. I didn't include it here. Uh, that kind of mimics a uh, carcinomas or, or or melanoma, but that's quite still kind of under uh, reviews. And then if you look at the clinical presentation, um, it goes without saying that the, the presentation will depend on the involved uh, side. And today we will we'll concentrate mainly on the, on the head and neck uh, sides. So you can actually divide the involved sides into either paramenegeal uh, side, uh, orbital sides, and other head and neck sides. So your paramenegeal sides, um, uh, which is, um, um, Basically involve the nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, meet the ear nasal pharynx, and um, and, and scalp base. And typically, uh, these um, uh, patients they are asymptomatic at early stages. Um, this is quite a bearing in terms of your management, as you find that most cases uh, these uh, uh, well, as soon as they present, they are unlikely to be amenable to to surgical intervention due to the fact that when they present with a uh, kind of local pressure symptoms, it's already an advanced disease. And they may uh, present with purulent or bloody otorrhea or rhinorrhea. Uh, they may present with upper erodigestive tract symptoms, like dysphagia or dinophagia or airway symptoms. And uh, with scalp based involvement, they will present with cranial nerve uh, fallout. And then, uh, in about ninety percent of the cases in the head and neck, um, these tumors are located in the in the in the orbit. I think a, 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 you know vast majority of uh, tumors that have been uh, referred to to us here in a Red Cross, um, the way the majority of them were localized in the orbit, and um, because of you know early presentation due to orbital symptoms, these tumors tend to have a good uh, prognosis. And um, uh, these are some of the features that um, the, 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 the children may present with. They may present with esophthalmos, uh, restriction in extraocular eye movements, um, thickening of the eyelids or periopital ecchymosis or strabismus. And um, the other, you know, head and neck structures that could be involved, um, you know, the pericranial aponeurosis and neck, salivary glands, larynx, spines, uh, thyroid and, and cheeks. And um, in terms of the, the differential diagnosis in children, we always um, consider a congenital um, lesions like thyroglossal cysts, brachial cysts, uh, demoids, teratomas, um, etc. Et 
and uh, inflammatory uh, 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 processes as well. Um, uh, those are some of the inflammatory processes that one may consider be it lymphadenopathy or chronic granulomatous diseases like your TB, your sarcoid, your histoplasmosis. Um, and you can uh, get other benign and other malignant tumors that may actually mimic uh, the um, eraptomyosarcoma uh, clinically as well as even histologically. And then um, one um, um, other entity that has got clinical value in terms of raptomyosarcoma is a molecular testing. And um, it is advisable. Uh, and actually, the diagnosis is actually should be based on um, the histology as well as the, the fusion gene status. Because this is, is quite a bearing uh, in terms of differentiating between the alveolar type um, and the embryonal type of, uh, uh, yeah, especially the alveolar and the embryonal type of uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, um, because uh, your management may actually be, be different. Um, and molecular testing is also helpful in tumors that have equivocal microscopy or uh, immunohistochemistry findings. Is um, you know it's been shown that actually uh, diagnosing these rhabdomyosarcomas uh, microscopically can quite can be uh, quite quite challenge, but um, I, I included these few um, uh, you know molecular kind of testing and the translocations that that okay in the most common types. As you can see in the alveolar type of uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, um, these these uh, is you know patients usually have got translocation in chromosome two and thirteen with the fusion of the Pax three and Fox one gene. And um, as you can see, if you compare the fusion of the of Fox, uh, Pax3 and Fox1 uh, to the fusion of the Pax7 and Fox1 gene, you will see that um, in, the, in, the, in the first instance, you know, these patients are usually younger and present with uh, extremity uh, lesions and have a, a better outcome as compared to patients with, uh, with the second trans translocation and, and fusion of uh, Pax7 and Fox1 gene. And you find that uh, you know in more than eighty percent of cases where these translocations are found, they are pathognostic. Uh, but one should take you know keep uh, keep this in mind that in about forty percent uh, of cases they lack uh, this FOXO FOXO one uh, re rearrangement. Uh, all this uh, basically leads to an increased transcription factor activity leading to uh, tumorigenesis. Um, and then if we look at the embryonal type. Um, this um, is usually due to uh, loss of uh, heterogeneity in, uh, in, in chromosome um, 11, um, leading to inactivation of uh, tumor uh, suppressor gene and invariably leading to tumor genesis. And uh, you find that these tumors are fusion negative, which helps differentiate them from um, from the alveolar type of rhabdomyosarcoma. And then you can have the sprinkle cell variant uh, with those um, uh, yeah, characteristic rearrangement, and it is associated with a favorable, favorable outcome. And then um, immunohistochemistry is also very useful in, um, in, in your workup for rhabdomyosarcoma and diagnosis. Um, and it is usually positive for muscle specific proteins. Uh, like actin, myosin, desmin, myoglobin, um, in, as well as ZPN protein and myogenic differentiation one protein, and then uh, these are quite useful in in you know in the differential diagnosis as um, you you one would want to differentiate these tumors from other uh, small round blue cell tumors that may present in childhood like a lymphoma, neuroblastoma, or a wings a wings sarcoma. <coughs> Um, so this is basically the peace treatment uh, staging. It is uh, quite different to the conventional, you know, uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma staging that we are used to. Um, so here you, want, you know, in the staging system, you have to consider the, the sites, uh, whether it's a favorable site, especially in the non, uh, you know, um, uh, perimeringial sites. Um, this is the you know the the the, the 
unfavorable size that is your uh, uh, paramaringia cells. And uh, you then consider the, the T staging, uh, the tumor size, N staging, as well as um, if they are uh, distant uh, metastasis or not. And then in addition to the TNM uh, pretreatment staging, there is also this uh, clinical group grouping classification. Uh, this is basically uh, you group your, your tumors in terms of um, the local extent um, of tumor as well as um, a, what for sort of surgical intervention was done? Was it complete resection uh, versus a, a biopsy, and whether there was involvement of um, of, of 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 lymph nodes? Um, and um, so this is basically grouped from from uh, one to four. For example, in group one, you have you know these are tumors that are localized, uh, completely resected, and with no regional node involvement. Uh, with subclass A confined to site of origin and subclass B infiltrating beyond site of origin. This is quite a bearing in terms of your, your, your prognosis and risk of, of, um, of, um, of, of recurrence. I won't go into much, um, into much detail. So as, uh, as I had alluded previously, so the, the TNM staging and the clinical grouping staging, they also, you know, together with your histologic findings, they help to, 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 to classify uh, or risk stratify your patients into a low risk, intermediate risk, and, um, and, 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 and high risk. And it goes without saying that the high risk tumors are more likely to, uh, to be more aggressive and more likely to, to recur. And then these are some of the poor prognostic factors. Uh, uh, as I have uh, alluded previously, that the paramenigial location is an, you know, is an unfavorable site. Um, a alveolar histologic subtype, you know, age under uh, one and above the you know, age of 10, if there's incomplete surgical resection before chemotherapy, and if there is regional uh, lymph node involvement. Uh, so I have included some of the examples of, of, of imaging. Um, so apparently, uh, the rhabdomyosarcomas, they do not have any uh, typical or characteristic uh, imaging uh, um, findings that you, you, you can differentiate them to from other tumors. So uh, the only way you could you can differentiate them from other tumors is by histological um, immuno and um, molecular analysis. And um, this is just an example of a patient that we have managed here, also at Red Cross, that's basically showed this, uh, so the tumor that was involved in skull base, um, and also uh, the right um, sort of orbital apex with the right, extending to the right um, temporal lobe, and uh, with involvement of, of the clavus. As you can see, there's all this bony, you know, erosion and effacement, and uh, there's this soft tissue density uh, basically, that's also involved the, um, the the sphenoid sinus and the right orbital apex. Um, and then this is another, you know, example of a quite extensive uh, tumor. Uh, these are all examples of patients that uh, have, uh, we've managed here at, um, at, at, at Red Cross. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get like coronal some CT coronal images, but you can see there's this huge, massive, uh, like soft tissue density with the uh, erosion of the pterygoid plates, kind of centered in the scalp is uh, area and involvement of the of the complete of opacification of, of, of this of the sphenoid sinuses, and even on MRI scan they have what uh, you know a variable characteristics. Uh, they do not have you know distinct characteristic features, but the MRI scan basically will help one to um, to differentiate, to, to assess for, you know, meningeal involvement, um, assess for orbital involvement, and also assess for cranial nerve involvement. Uh, this was a patient that we managed, it was managed here by the um, oncologist uh, team at Red Cross, uh, and basically this was a pre-treatment um, um, MRI scan, and uh, as you can see, this is a post uh, chemotherapy MRI scan, which shows um, a complete resolution of disease. This is basically another example. As you can see, mostly these tumors are 
rise in the orbit or are very closely associ associated with the with the orbit. And many times they are referred to us for 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 wake up uh, mainly for 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 trans uh, transnasal a uh, transnasal um, a biopsy. So we, as we, if we look at the management, it goes without say that, I mean, every uh, malignancy nowadays is managed in a multidisciplinary setting and uh, the treatment, treatment options could either be medical or surgical or, you know, uh, radiotherapy. So I'll touch a little bit on the chemotherapy and radiotherapy, though this is not the, the main, um, my, my, the main um, um, issues around this talk. Uh, so uh, the chemotherapy, if we look at rhabdomyosarcoma, that's the basic treatment option. And those are the regimens that are, are, are used in combination. Um, and uh, the, the drug combinations basically will, will depend on the the, the risk uh, the, the the risk group of the patient uh, the histologic subtype uh, whether you know there was completeness of primary resection and uh, the age of the patient as well as 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 the general condition and um, radiotherapy is usually employed uh, for local tumor control and uh, the treatment dose is individualized but generally about 35 to 50 gays are used um, so you know one can vary the dose depending on um, on whether you want to treat microscopic or macroscopic disease uh, and a smaller dose is usually you know indicated to treat microscopic disease uh, where surgery was incomplete and higher doses indicated for uh, either residual disease or or unresectable tumors and then um, if we Look at the, the the role of surgery. Basically, there is uh, there are two main indications for um, uh, you know search, say, for for surgical intervention. Uh, one is for for biopsy, you know, to obtain um, a specimen, and um, uh, the second role would be in um, in therapy. So we we'll start by looking at the um, the role of of surgery in in terms of uh, of biopsy, so it is quite important in uh, if we look at these tumors to provide actually adequate uh, material uh, because you want is to um, to perform histological analysis, immunos, uh, cytogenetics, we need to do biological tumor studies and also for tumor uh, um, banking. And um, a, a biopsy should uh, it goes without say that it should be the initial procedure in all patients, except in cases where complete resection. Uh, will be physical at the first setting. And then the if we look at the types of biopsy, uh, one may do an incisional biopsy, uh, but it is uh, of paramount importance that when you are performing an incisional biopsy, uh, your biopsy site, uh, you know, one should be able to include the biopsy site in the subsequent definitive um, surgery or, 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 or radiotherapy. So basically you apply the same oncological principles of, uh, of, uh, of, of biopsy that we employ in, in, in other tumors. And a one you know, should uh, carefully achieve hemostasis and avoid hematoma formation. And uh, drains are generally not uh, recommended. And however, if they are used, then you sh one should make sure that the tract must be in line and close to the to the skin incision, you know. So uh, the the reason being that if one needs to include that site in uh, definitive surgery or or radiotherapy. Um, so a fine needle aspiration is uh, contraindicated for primary tumor diagnosis, and um, however, you, it can be used uh, when one needs to sample enlarged lymph nodes um, that may you know that were picked up either clinically. Or, or radiologically. And uh, one or can also employ endoscopic biopsies, um, which is basically appropriate in, in specific tumor size, like uh, if you want to do a transnasal biopsy, um, and uh, at times they use it in a pelvic or, uh, or intra-abdominal biopsies. And um, you know, image guidance may be indicated in some cases, as we have seen in those uh, CT images that I, I, I did show previously that in most cases, these tumors may be, you know, um, in, in closely associated with the orbit or scalp-based uh, structures where, you know, one may encounter either vascular 
um, important vascular on your on, 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 on uh, structures or or on, on necks. So uh, you find that one may actually need to use a neural navigation or um, a CT guided um, a biopsies. Um, and there's also a role for coordinated biopsy. Um, however, why this should be performed under image guidance uh, to avoid complications as one may actually hit a major vessel. And um, this is uh, image guidance is actually important again uh, as one you know wants to avoid a cystic or necrotic parts. Um, and it is actually important that prior to um, embarking on this um, type of biopsy, uh, one uh, discusses with the radio oncologist and uh, you in terms of uh, which uh, sites uh, the the uh, radiologist should uh, should uh, target as far as biopsy is concerned. And um, again, the scar should be in a site that uh, could be included in future definitive uh, surgery or radiotherapy. And one should obtain multiple calls uh, for the reasons that I alluded previously, because you need um, a few specimens for uh, for histopathology, molecular uh, wake-up immunos, as well as for um, um, molecular testing. Um, and then if we look at the role, therapeutic role of surgery, um, so the thera there is you know, a therapeutic role of surgery in cases where there's no clear clinical evidence of lymph nodes. Uh, involvement or metastatic disease. And uh, you may embark on surgery where you know, tumor can be excised with a predictive uh, R0 margins. These are, um, you know, R0 margins are margins that are more than um, a centimeter um, clear microscopic uh, margins. So as long as one, you know, can embark on surgery without a danger or mutilation. So in mutilating operations should never be considered a primary resection because as we know that these tumors, they actually respond to uh, chemotherapy and, um, and radiotherapy. So one should avoid embarking on, on quite extensive operations as, um, as the primary you know, treatment modality, uh, like uh, an orbital exaggeration or major resection of the face. And, um, and uh, just note that there's no role for debugging procedures at diagnosis. And then uh, the other role for surgery is, uh, is uh, for pre-treatment or pre-chemotherapy re-excision. Uh, so in cases where, where you know, a surgery was used as primary treatment modality, and uh, there is either you know, a microscopic, be it certain or a doubtful microscopic disease, one may embark on um, a repeat uh, surgery to achieve, uh, you know, um, RNA margins. And um, the interval between initial surgery and chemotherapy should never exceed, should never exceed eight weeks and uh, should uh, be performed uh, without any, you know, danger or, or mutilation. And then if we look at uh, the space, you know, the role of surgery in, 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 in specific kind of tumor sites. Uh, so we'll look at the paramenegial uh, sites first. Uh, if you look at the paramenegial sites, like your, you know, middle ear, uh, your nasal pharynx, you know, and nasal cavity and scalp is, you find that actually, you know, primary RNA node resections are usually impossible, um, you know, for the, for obvious reasons due to the complexity of the of the head and neck anatomy, and you know, in also trying to spare uh, vital structures, it's it's quite impossible to achieve aranoid resection. And then, even when aranoid resections are possible, uh, they may result in quite significant uh, morbidity, and therefore not uh, not indicated. And it is mandatory for one to obtain a pre, you know biopsy MRI scan with or without. Um, a CT scan for reasons I've alluded previous to on your imaging. Um, CSF studies are also indicated as one, you know, CF, CF studies may be positive, you know, prior to your radiological, radiological findings. And then um, one may need to, you know, sample the lymph nodes and, and also do a cranial nerve assessment in, in these tumors. 
uh, and um, you know a complete resection should not you know be attempted in these tumors as it, it is actually associated with quite significant um, morbidity and in most cases radiotherapy is is always um, the, the 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 mode of, of, of therapy and um, a, however, a surgery may be considered when where there is residual mass after after chemo uh, chemotherapy, and in cases where they are debilitating uh, local effects, for example, a, in a patients with um, a, a neck tumor that is causing um, upper airways obstruction, and um, actually in these cases that is where one may embark on debulking surgery. And um, we, you know, this helps as you know, one can avoid a, a tracky and its complications. And um, this has actually been shown to improve the delivery of chemo and um, and um, radiotherapy due to reduction of the tumor bulk. And uh, if we look at uh, the paramenial sites, um, the infratemporal fossa and maxillary sinus are. Uh, actually the two sides that are more amenable to aranoid resection uh, and they have a lesser morbidity with a well-planned kind of surgical approach and, and, um, and reconstruction. And then if we look at surgery uh, with or without you know, radiotherapy, uh, you'll find that oh, for, for obvious reasons, I mean, there are more surgical complications with uh, neoadjuvant radiotherapy and um, if surgical, uh, if surgery is a consideration, one needs to avoid um, uh, pre-operative uh, uh, radiotherapy to prevent, you know, uh, the morbidity or associated with the complications. Um, uh, and then, if one has to uh, use um, a surgery with radiotherapy, you should employ, you know, a combination uh, procedure that they call AMO, that is the ablative surgery mollage technique, bracket therapy with the surgical. Uh, reconstruction in this entity, it is a uh, kind of a single stage approach where you know in the one should consider surgery and uh, and a, a bracket therapy and reconstruction in 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 uh, in, in almost kind of a same um, say same um, um, same package. And then um, again, if we're looking at reconstruction, uh, one needs to review the margin status of uh, of the of the of this specimen a tumor or site um, prior to reconstruction, so it you know it, it so that it can you know reconstruction can be delayed in cases of uh, positive margin or in cases where one needs to employ pre uh, pre treatment re excision. Uh, however, I mean, delayed reconstruction may be impossible in some instances, uh, for example, where there is brain exposure or where there is uh, um, a CSF leak, one may need to actually embark on the reconstructive uh, procedure in the same setting as, uh, as primary surgery. And um, of, of importance is uh, your ablative or reconstructive uh, surgical options should not uh, modify the radiotherapy um, a treatment that should be adapted to the radiotherapy fields. And then, um, and now we we'll look on the more favorable sites, that is the non paramedial sites. Um, and these sites have an overall good prognosis and uh, surgery has a more central uh, role due to the location of these, of these tumors. And um, surgery can be employed for small tumors with um, you know neoadjuvant chemotherapy indicated for uh, nasolabial oral cavity, uh, you know pharyngeal space, laryngeal and thyroid lesions, um, and uh, you should note that you know delaying surgery may actually affect the need for for for, for radiotherapy, and uh, due to accessibility of these sites, you know incisional biopsy is usually the main approach. Uh, however, a core needle biopsy may be employed in uh, in the thyroid and the uh, um, uh, uh, parotid and uh, neck and also the cheek lesions. And then again, if we look at the, the, the subsite, uh, I mean, for due to easy accessibility, if there's you know, isolated scalp involvement, uh, surgery is the rule. Um, you, and one may, may try to avoid uh, radiotherapy and, and you know, in trying to prevent the uh, radiodystrophic uh, uh, 
um, secular of radiotherapy on this on the on the on the scalp that it on the scalp that it, it is undergone surgery. Um, and uh, if you look at the parotid, um, I think management here depends on the you know extent of the tumor and the feasibility of patient nerve preservation. Um, but you know, however, after chemotherapy, you know, residual tumor surgery plus radiotherapy may actually uh, salvage, you know, the residual facial nerve function. Again, this, especially in the parotid, your, your surgical approach probably depend on the tumor extent, you know, and um, how you know involved the, you know, the the, the your your facial nerve um, um, is. And then um, on the uh, the other subsite is the cheek. Uh, I mean, due to accessibility, primary surgery is uh, indicated where complete resection and primary closure is possible. And uh, however, if not, then you delay surgery and and give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, and we try and avoid uh, radiotherapy due to its, its consequences and complications. Uh, you know, uh, except in the nasal labia for 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 cosmetic um, uh, for cosmetic um, uh, reasons, uh, and then if one has to avoid uh, radiotherapy, you may uh, in the nasal labia region one you know needs to consider a, a reconstruction um, of that primary site, and then uh, the AMO approach uh, actually may limit the extent. Of, of resection and uh, the area subjected to long term or sequela of, of, of radiotherapy, because in this in this case you know you do um, a, an ablative surgery with the kind of targeted a, a bracket therapy which reduces the morbidity associated with the radiotherapy. And then if you look at the oral cavity and oral pharynx, uh, the mainstay of treatment is chemotherapy uh, and. Uh, you know, delayed surgery in cases of residual disease due to the consideration of uh, the functional outcome of surgery is, uh, you know, we know the morbidity associated with the resection of more than 50% of the, of the tongue or the, or, or the, or the, or the tongue base. So, um, you know, however, if, if one, if, if one has to, 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 to avoid um, radiotherapy, the section can be an option, but you should always take into consideration uh, the morbidity associated with uh, with um, uh, those types of resection. And then, if we look at the larynx, I mean, laryngeal treatment is 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 uh, individualized. Um, as as we know, these tumors are quite you know more more common in 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 children. In children, would not tolerate. A tracheostomy and speech uh, interruption as much as, as, as in adults. And uh, the, 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 you know, laryngeal rhabdomyosarcoma is, is actually chemo sensitive and can be treated with chemo, chemo uh, radio, radiotherapy. And in, in most instances, you know, if one employs radiotherapy as the primary uh, um, uh, treatment um, approach, uh, in, 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 in a few instances, you know, you may get a, a post radiotherapy circular that may eventually lead to a total laryngectomy, which is, will be associated with more complications in the setting of a, of a previous radiotherapy. And, um, and um, in, some, in some centers, they employ a partial laryngectomy with uh, chemotherapy, which has been shown, you know, to have a good local control. With uh, with minimal side with minimal side side effect, and the other subsides like hypopharynx approach is more or less similar to the to the larynx. But if one embarks on surgery, you know one may avoid a, a total laryngectomy depending on the site of involvement. The thyroid and parathyroid are very rare, very very rare sites. Um, but one can do a thyroidectomy or parathyroidectomy if you if you can achieve. Um, in R not uh, resection, and um, the, if we look at the opit, as the opit has got excellent long-term control with chemotherapy or radiotherapy, and um, important in these cases, one is to avoid meningeal contamination at at, at biopsy, and uh, surgery is only indicated in cases of of of, of recurrence. And then, if we look look at a uh, neck involvement. Um, Primary surgery is actually indicated if if your extent of resection will allow you know a primary a primary closure, 
and uh, usually the AMO appro approach is also employed. And um, if radiotherapy is inevitable, uh, you know, and you know, a set surgery is also um, a, if radiotherapy is inevitable and surgery is indicated with either R node that is clear margins or R one that is positive microscopic find a positive uh, microscopic disease with the brachytherapy not offering any advantage. And then one should randomize these patients to either a preoperative or, or post-operative um, radiotherapy. And then if we look at uh, management of the, of, uh, of the neck in, in, in terms of uh, not a metastasis, uh, Rhabdomyosarcoma has a, a low incidence of nodal metastasis of about 3 to 17%. However, the alveolar type has a much higher inc incidence of uh, uh, lymph node metastasis. And one should, I'm sorry for the type of consider surgical lymph node staging uh, for alveolar type of fusion, fusion positive uh, subtype of uh, rhabdomyosarcomas. And, uh, you know, one uh, should also consider echelon uh, lymph nodes uh, sampling or sentinel lymph node uh, biopsies in, 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 in these cases where we suspect a nodal metastasis. And uh, radiotherapy is effective, especially if there's gross nodal metastasis with um, uh, extra nodal extension. And uh, surgery uh, or radiotherapy is indicated in oligometastasis. Uh, in you know where there's no external extension, and um, one may employ is either selective uh, a neck dissection, a comprehensive neck dissection, or uh, radiotherapy. But they are, however, there are no studies comparing the outcomes between uh, neck dissection and radiotherapy in in, in rhabdomyosarcoma. And if you look at the metastatic disease. I mean, uh, these if metastatic disease associated with poor outcomes and responds better to chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And uh, very rare, in rare instances where surgery is considered is uh, instances where there's an isolated step of metastasis with acceptable um, disease uh, free survival. And um, yeah, in, in summary, I mean, rhabdomyosarcomas. Um, very rare soft tissue tumors of childhood. And a treatment is basically individualized and involves a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, and actually careful a selection of surgical candidate is of paramount importance, especially in head and neck to reduce uh, morbidity and um, involvement in chemotherapy strategies, you know, radiotherapy and surgical strategies has led to uh, improved uh, survival, especially for localized, um, for localized disease. And those are my references. And thank you very much. I would uh, open the floor for any uh, contributions and uh, a few questions. Thank you, Charles, for an excellent presentation. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the floor? Well, Charles, that is a very excellent presentation. Uh, and just, just one question, why is my new aspiration? Are you still there? We, we are here, so. Charles? Can you hear? Charles, are you able to hear us? Yeah. Can't hear us? Can't let me hear you. Charles, we are able to hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, we can hear you. Um, can you hear us? Oh, that's strange because we're off mute. Oh, Pop, Pop has a question. Hey, Charles, I was as an inquisitor. Why is fine needle aspiration cytology contraindicated for the primary? <clears throat> Charles, did you hear that? 
The child was inquisitive, eyes, finding aspirations, apology, can't be indicated for the primary tumor. I think you speak. Uh, I think you might be muted to speak. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Prof is asking why the finite aspiration is not indicated in in in. Okay, so Prof was asking why the, the fire needle aspiration is not indicated in, 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 in primary tumor. Um, so the, 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 from, from what I, I, I came across, I think the reason was being, um, it, it is quite difficult to diagnose a raptomyosis sarcoma from just a fire needle aspiration because of um, other kind of tumors that, uh, you know, if uh, you know present with this uh, you know a, a, a round, small round blue cell um, uh, uh, tumors and um, sorry with, because of these other uh, tumors that I have alluded to on my differentials that can also present a you know the histological picture of a small round blue cell tumor um, and um, you know due to the fact that now is kind of an, a guideline um, in addition to also the histological diagnosis one needs to perform um, the, 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 the molecular uh, the molecular analysis as well but yeah that was my my uh, my understanding on on probably why they didn't recommend FNA but I think in cases where one is suspecting um, you know, um, and uh, like an, another differential like a squamous cell carcinoma, one would still use an FNA. But I think if you are in high suspicion of, of rapnomyosarcoma, sarcoma, they, they did not recommend an FNA of the of the primary. I'm not sure if profit that that answers the your question. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor? Thank you, Charles, for an excellent presentation. We'll end the meeting now. Thank you.